Hey everyone, time for another 3 at 3 on Solar PV. I'm Jen Runyon, Chief Editor of Renewable Energy World. I'm Paula Mintz, Chief Market Research Analyst, uh, SPV Market Research. And we want to thank IREC, our sponsor, the Interstate Renewable Energy Council. Hey Paula, how's it going? Hey Jen, it's going fine. Thank you IREC and all the good work you do. Yeah, for sure. Okay, we take three topics. We talk about them for three minutes each. Today we're going to talk about Solar World, Sun Power, and the Utility of the Future. So Ooh. let's start with Solar World and Sun Power, and, and it's really kind of a related topic because the news last week is that Sun Power is going to buy Solar World. Interesting development. Yeah. Yes, and oh, what a tangled web you weave when you uh, enter into a strategic acquisition and uh, tariff situation. Yeah, so what could this mean for us? What does this mean for solar? Well, first of all, it must be remembered that it needs to pass regulatory approval yes. both here and in Germany, and that doesn't always happen. And what it means for solar, you, you, what it means, it's, so it's a little complex, and I'll make it as quick as I can. This does relate to the 2012 and 2014 tariffs, 2012 China, 2014 um, Taiwan, mm -hmm. instigated that petition instigated by Solar World Germany, I mean Solar World US, but really Solar World, Solar World Germany couldn't do it if it wasn't the US. Uh, so basically, when those tariffs expire, if solar, if Sun Power acquires Solar World, if that goes through, it would be the only at this point crystal and cell manufacturer in the U.S. Yeah. and thus would have influence or be the decider. Essentially, it would be the important party. It would be the petitioner. It could let those expire. It could extend them. It could say another country, say South Korea with LG, a significant competitor, is really the injury, uh, the party that needs to be focused wow. on. I mean, could they really so say it, that? Oh, it could. Yeah, it, it puts it in the catbird seat, um, so to speak. Yeah. But it also makes it pr the probability of an exclusion from the current 201 tariffs increases. Hmm. Now, Back into this little soap opera, soap opera, bleh, soap opera on the solar world side again. Solar World uh, instigated the first two, uh, joined the petition with Suniva, mm -hmm. and then now is insolvent again, as we discussed, I think, a couple of shows ago. You know, an ironic victim of the tariffs that you know the two hundred one tariffs because yeah, yes ironically funny here so on the sun power side sun power tried in uh suggesting that it would uh, start pilot scale production which by the way a lot of people don't realize is different from commercial production yeah so starting pilot scale would would give them crystal and cell capacity here but not commercial the second thing they did was say we're you know we're gonna have to lay off lots of people. It's going to cost us millions. That's inarguable. It will cost them money. Mm -hmm. um, and now they've acquired a not entirely compatible, just because it's monocrystalline doesn't mean it's the same monocrystalline uh, manufacturer in the U.S. or are trying to acquire. Yeah. This, <clears throat> it, this uh, manufacturer has, and they've indicated they will keep some of the production of their cells you know, going in the U.S., which they have to do. So when they say they're going to keep the legacy products going, it's not the goodness of their heart. It's that in order to have all these other things be true, they have to have cell production in the U.S. Yeah, so right. They can keep for now the cell production of Solar World going. They would need to add module capacity, module assembly capacity, and then they would be importing cells for that because Solar World really isn't known for the 72 plus cell modules which is the trend of the industry yeah. so that's really facts so so much to talk about there i mean so so uh, bottom line i guess is that solar world uh, sun power which was a victim of the tariffs is now going to be in the controlling seat as a decider of the tariffs would be in the de a decider of the 2012-2014 
extension of the tariffs or expiration of the tariffs or new country with the 201 has a better chance of an exclusion of, of getting an exclusion interesting yeah so lots to watch and so this has to go through it's it's uh, all its regulatory oversight um, shareholders need to approve all that good stuff when do you like how long does that take I, you know, right off the top of my, it always takes a long time. I mean, think about all the, think about other industries and how long. So I, I don't have an answer to that. But I think the most interesting question is how will SunPower behave when it is the decider? And it, this could be a very short term thing. It takes a long time to start up cell production. Yeah. But if Jinko finally decides what it wants to do, and if part of that is even 25 megawatts of cell production, then SunPower has uh, acquired a very expensive asset and no longer is in the It is no longer the only cell. Yeah, 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 right. interesting. Well, all right, let's take, we'll keep our eye on that. Let's take a minute to uh, talk a little bit about IREC. IREC increases access yep. to sustainable energy and energy efficiency through independent, fact-based policy leadership quality workforce development and consumer empowerment. Through its work in nearly every state, IREC's customer focus has made clean energy possible for millions more Americans by removing regulatory barriers since 1982. And thank that, you, IREC. Yeah, thank you, IREC. It's a really great segue into our next topic, which is some state movements on distributed energy resources and you know, that utility of the future that we always right. like to talk about, but you know, the fact is it's really hard to make a utility change its ways. So or maybe what, what we're really talking about is the trans transmission and distribution network of the future, which will look different. I mean, yeah. it's, the, it's like utility scale solar. Utility scale is a great buzzword. I mean, utility of the future is great and we need to, that's a good hat for this. But we're really talking about that. Yeah, no, you're right. We're talking about the distribution system. So, um, right. So in Hawaii, we have a new law on the books just signed by the governor last week called the Ratepayer Protection Act. And this directs the utility to actually change its business model so that it can no longer recover any capital expenditures through its rate base. So what that means is right now utilities spend money building new lines, building, changing, uh, upgrading things, and um, and they're allowed to just put that on their, their rate payers. That will no longer be the case. Now they will have to find new ways of getting compensated. And the Public Utilities Commission is the one that's going to have to sort of usher them through this new new way of doing business. The interesting thing about the law is that it says the utilities now should be rewarded for things like customer satisfaction, for energy efficiency, for renewables integration, a lot of things that are hard to quantify. Uh, in and dollars, very at least. <laughs> yeah, well, you, you can't really quantify appropriately satisfaction because a lot of uh, cu customer satisfaction, as you and I have discussed and I've done work in that, it's qualitative 100% of the time. It could be your mood that day. Yeah. It could be you, know, you could be mad at the utility sure. or some yeah. other provider. Yeah. You could decide. You could be the type of person who just says, "Eh, I give them the best rating, no matter what." Yeah. So those surveys are very difficult to set a compensation um, schedule based on that. Is would be really hard. hard. Would be really you know, complex. Bias. I mean, to do it correctly yeah. is probably close to impossible, and filled, 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 filled with bias. Plus, um, lots of consultant and attorney money. Yeah, for sure. I mean, and and so <laughs> how are you going to rate for that? You know. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Right. No, but that's a really good point. I mean, and so then on the other side of the country, we've got the District of Columbia, which introduced legislation earlier this month, earlier in April, actually. Um, called the uh, Distributed Energy Resource Authority. They want to create a governing body to look at how distributed energy resources are being implemented in the District of Columbia and DC. Um, and whenever a utility proposes a new project that may cost the ratepayers money, this governing body would then be tasked with determining whether or not there is a distributed solution 
that would be better, more cost effective for the people. So for example, they would say, well, can we meet this new, you know, you need to build, you need to upgrade this node or this part of your your, uh, distribution system. Could we do that with energy efficiency? Could we do that with demand response? Could we do that with renewables and storage? That's an interesting way around it. Another way to look at... Well, you know, to to be a bit of... um you know, my usual self here. <laughs> Isn't that already their job? Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, it, it seems like it ought to be. I, I agree with and, you there. It definitely and, seems like they should be looking for the least cost way to do that, anything. But they're not. You know, as we know, they're not. Because they're, <laughs> they're making money. The way they make money is by rate basing expenses, things that no, they I mean, the, I mean the PUCs. I mean the, uh, oh, the PUCs, uh, yes. Yeah. Right, that's their job description. Yes. That is part of their job that description. Absolutely. So, yes. so now they're regulating something that actually was part of their job or should have been, and apparently they weren't doing. There's an, but yeah, yeah, a new and, authority and, to look at that. Yeah, we've talked about this in the past. Utilities aren't going to do it on their own. Right. I mean, so if you think back to the RPS, RPS standards are foundations in the United Renewable Portfolio Standards, they force the utilities to develop the incentives and programs, yada, 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 to drive um, to drive uh, solar. Let's look just look at solar, but okay, wind sure. yeah. deployment. So it's such a complex system, but you can't rely. And back to what we've been talking about for a long time, the utility of the future. You, you can't count on them deciding to change something that's not in their economic benefit to do no, without no. being yeah absolutely I mean and so I think as with you know everything else we've talked about we're gonna wait and see and watch this I mean I think the the important thing to note here is that at least states are paying attention and taking some steps towards this new way of doing business in the energy business which is you know we, we are transforming we're transforming the whole industry and right. we need to transform the utility systems and you wrote a great article on that recently, didn't you? I did write an article about the well about the Hawaiian one, if that's what you're. Yeah, but to. but really, it, it applies. Yeah. It, you know, so you wrote a great, thoughtful piece discussing this in the context of Hawaii. But what we're talking about here is the broader context. So we could also look on the upside. This is the tip of the iceberg, where it's obvious, despite the current administration, that state by state by state, this is the direction. Yeah. Absolutely. And we are out of time. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks to our sponsor, IREC. We'll see you next time on 3.3 on Solar PV. Bye.